Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get started with the chapter one slides. And um, what we're going to really be doing in these first couple of slides is getting down some definitions, um, just general um, information in slide one, and, I mean, excuse me, in chapter one. And then in chapter two, we're actually going to start to talk about some definitions related to uh, economics, related to uh, banking, it would be our two major topics in chapter two. And I'm hoping uh, to get through both of those chapters. If not, if we don't get all the way through, we'll finish chapter two next time. Okay. So let's just go ahead and take a look at some uh, basics and we're going to talk about some terms that I'm sure you've probably heard before uh, profit uh, the difference between the objectives of a uh, for-profit business versus a not-for-profit business uh, something called factors of production uh, these are the things that companies utilize to uh, uh, actually end up earning a profit assuming they're a for-profit company we're going to talk about competition and um, that is something that we're going to get into more detail in in chapter two. Uh, what are the four types of businesses? And then uh, just a little bit of a discussion for us all here. Uh, how do our life skills translate to the business environment? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. And we have business entities offer their product and they are trying to earn a profit. This is why uh, we go into business, um, we open up a sandwich shop, whatever it is, and we are hoping that our revenues will exceed our expenses. And if they do, uh, then we can determine that this company uh, has earned a profit. Okay. So when we report that, and we're going to get into financial reporting a little bit later, but just to give us a sense as to how that might look, we would go ahead and have in our financial statements and we would have revenue. I don't know, say a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And then we would go ahead and subtract from that our, our uh, costs. Okay, if we're selling sandwiches, whatever it costs us to put those sandwiches together, and let's say that's seventy thousand dollars, right? And that difference is going to be, and even though we're not saying it here, we often call that a gross profit. We'd have a gross profit of say thirty thousand dollars. Now, this slide is calling it expenses, but uh, to talk about profit, it's usually our revenue minus our cost. And uh, this would be the ingredients that went into the sandwich, whatever, uh, would be our cost. And then we usually then talk about expenses. I don't know, we got to pay the sandwich makers their wages, whatever. And so let's say our expenses, and I'm just making these numbers up as we go along here, guys, are 17,000. So 30,000 minus the 17,000 is going to leave us what? $13,000 left? Am I doing my math right? Okay. That 13,000 is usually what we would call net income. So even though they're calling it profit here, um, and you hear that thrown around a lot, and people will say, oh, well, what's your profit on that? The correct term would really be, what's your net income? What's your income? But uh, the book is being very general here in that they're talking about profit, revenue minus cost. And that's a very high level uh, way of describing it. But we are here to earn a profit. For-profit entities have a profit motive. If they are a, say, a corporation, they are trying to make profit for their 
stockholders, right? So that their stockholders can, uh, you know, see the the stock, uh, price of the stock increasing, that sort of thing. Okay. So our revenues minus our, and they're saying expenses. I think it'd be better to say cost. But that difference between revenue expenses, revenue cost is called profit. And I'm saying that you could be a little bit more refined. I'm an accountant, so of course I'm going to look at it maybe a little differently than maybe non-accountants would. But to me, it's more technically corrected than say, off of your gross profit come your expenses, and that difference is net income. Okay, now what types of items do businesses sell? And we have goods versus services. So what happens if somebody comes in? and cleaned your house they are providing you a service aren't they okay if somebody sells you say a computer that is a product that you're being sold so typically businesses that are driven off the sales of goods and or services right and you could have somebody doing both right selling you goods and services they sell you the computer and then later on they sell you the maintenance or um, you know technical support with the computer as well so it's not like the company has to just be in one or the other um, but the things that companies offer are uh, goods and or services okay now we have for-profit entities. Again, they are trying to earn a profit. Again, the what the uh, revenue minus whatever it is, the cost of whatever they sold you, assuming um, it was some sort of product they were selling you, gives me my gross profit. And then, of course, I would take off other expenses like salaries, that sort of thing, and come up with my net income. And we are there to produce a net income so that there's some money left over at the end, right? so that we can go out and buy whatever we want for our own personal use, right? That's what we're in business for. And you take a look and they tell us that there are also not-for-profit organizations. Now, not-for-profit organizations obviously do not have a profit motive. So not-for-profit organizations are going to be focused more on the efficient delivery of services and those services are what not necessarily designed to generate a profit for the not-for-profit they are there to help individuals that need more um, help and society has decided that we're going to go ahead and provide that help anybody have an example of a not-for-profit organization that you're aware of Many hospitals are not for profit. Some hospitals are for profit, right? Some hospitals can be run by the government. But yeah, um, when I was going to college, community college in Hayward, I think I mentioned last time I'm from Hayward, I went to Chabot College. And when I was there, uh, I was a, ha a uh, janitor in a hospital, okay? And it was uh, the Sisters of Providence run by the Catholic Church in Oakland, Providence Hospital in Oakland. That was a not-for-profit hospital, right? Um, now, even though you may be a not-for-profit hospital, you often will still charge for some of the services that are provided, right? But you're not there to uh, to make a huge profit. Yeah, so that would be a good example. Um, any others? Any other example not-for-profits? Uh, ever heard of United Way? Okay, United Way is a not-for-profit organization, gathers money. They consider that a health and welfare organization. Um, Red Cross, okay, we see some of these disasters and whatnot go on, and Red Cross is always there. Another example of not-for-profit organizations, right? Huh? Goodwill is not-for-profit organization, right? Okay, so uh, all of these would be example of not-for-profit, and they're there to uh, provide social benefit, not so much to earn a profit, okay? And uh, so we have uh, not-for-profit versus for-profit entities. For-profit entities are trying to make profit for their owners, right? Not-for-profit organizations are trying to help society. 
Okay, good. So this is a question from your homework, guys, and this is the right out of your homework file from, uh, not your homework, but your quiz file. So I've gone ahead and I've uh, put these in to the slides now, and I'm going to continue to do that just so we can better see how the uh, quiz questions connect up to the material. So when you go back through to study this and prep for your exam, you can see um, how they work together. So we say here that when a company's revenue is greater than its expenses, we know that the company has done what? Has earned a, and they're calling it a profit. I would prefer that they call it net income, has net income, but that's all right. We'll, we'll let them get away with not being technical CPA accountants, and we'll let them go ahead and call this a uh, profit. Okay, good. And uh, you can see the solution there. Company earns a profit when it makes more revenue uh, than it spends. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at another one. Uh, the physical product that a business offers are called, and if it's a physical product, it's what? It's goods. Very good. Okay, not services, goods. Okay, so the answer is A again here, okay, from your quiz. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look then at something called factors of production. And isn't this great? If you didn't have a nice breakfast, now you're hungry, right? Okay, so what's happening? We've got this uh, sandwich here, and uh, how did this sandwich come to be? Well, we probably had some factors of production that went into it. For example, a factor of production is labor, right? Labor is a common factor production. Very few uh, goods are produced without labor, right? Very few services are provided. In fact, no service can really be provided without labor of some sort, okay? Natural resources. What are natural resources? Um, the cheese is a natural resource. The bread is a natural resource. The lettuce, practically everything that went into this sandwich is what? Is a natural resource and that we had to use land to grow the items that go into the, uh, into the trees. Too bad we can't have a, uh, a sandwich plantation where we just go and pick the sandwiches right out of the ground. Unfortunately, we have to do what? We get the um, natural resources that then go in to um, this sandwich, but these are the things that go into the development of this sandwich. We call it natural resources, okay? Then we have capital, okay? Capital, what is capital? Well, we have financial capital, we have real capital. Let's talk about financial capital first, okay? Can we open up a sandwich shop if we don't have any financial capital? Probably not. Probably not. Probably whoever owns the building is going to ask us if we're even if we're renting the building where our sandwich shop is, they're going to ask us for a down payment. Uh, we're going to have to buy equipment, etc. So we're absolutely going to need some financial capital. Now we can borrow that financial capital. We can have it on hand because we have saved it. We could sell ownership shares in the company, we call that stock, to raise this factor production, which is financial capital, right? Now, we also talk about real capital. What is that? Well, let's say we already owned a building. If we already owned a building, then what? Then we would not have to worry about raising financial capital to be able to have that building for our sandwich shop because we would contribute real estate real capital. When they say real capital, they mean real estate, right? Okay, so we have what? We have our labor, we have our capital, both real estate capital, real capital, financial capital, and then we have coming into the uh, production of this sandwich here, natural resources, right? Okay, then what? Then we start to call out, in these first three, um, a lot of this theory that we're going to be talking about in the economics discussion comes from uh, someone named Adam Smith. 
and you'll learn more about Adam Smith when you take Business 102, which is the economics course. Adam Smith came up with a lot of this economic theory that we're going to be talking about in these first couple of chapters. And a lot of what he talked about were the factors of production, labor, natural resources, and capital. Because in that time, that was pretty much when he was... Uh, um, observing all of these things that was pretty much what it took to be in business and that drove the economy at those time right, at that time um, now we do what now we see that we have other factors of production such as entrepreneurial talent the idea okay uh, for our business so what Steve Jobs had a lot of entrepreneurial talent, didn't he? Because he says since he uh, came up with the idea for the iPhone, for the, before that, the Apple computers, uh, using the Windows approach, a lot of entrepreneurial talent there, right? Uh, Tesla, right here in Fremont, a lot of entrepreneurial talent going on there, right? Okay, then what? Then we have intellectual property. Intellectual property is when we develop a patent for example, that only allows us to produce a certain type of product. Okay, um, a Apple really sued Samsung for the what for the patent for the um, use of the iPhone because that was something that they had developed that touch screen and Samsung just sort of copied that and so they actually won a lawsuit because their patent was violated so once you have a patent to produce something I don't know let's say I produce an iPhone a telephone that reads my thoughts all I have to do is hold it up to my head and it knows who I want to call now, of course, that would be pretty tough to produce that. But if I did, obviously, I would want to patent that technology so that only I can produce the mind-reading telephone, right? Whatever it is, okay? So this is considered intellectual property, patents, trademarks, those sort of things, okay? Technology, obviously, is a factor of production. Uh, the Internet is probably a key technology that is driving much of what's going on with the economy now as we have much more web-based businesses that sort of thing okay the internet in terms of technology is extremely important and because it is reducing the cost of delivering many services for example education industry more and more we're getting away from having people come to a classroom because we can educate online that sort of thing and I'm sure you've uh, looked at online classes uh, that is a factor production that impacts uh, for example education okay so all of these are factors of production we have labor we have natural resources, we have capital, both real and financial, and I'm sort of saying those have long been long held as traditional factors of production, but now we start to add in some of these other things, uh, entrepreneurial talent, intellectual property, and technology. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look and see if we can figure which of these is a uh, factor of production. Labor is a factor of production that refers to any physical or blank work people contribute to a business. And we have what? We have uh, what? Physical or intellectual, right? If it, uh, uh, those were our factors of production, physical or which was labor and then what intellectual is also going to be a uh, factor of production okay okay good so uh, let's take a look at this next one now and uh, I'm gonna have to start to figure out uh, how to make the answer something different than a for a change right because uh, don't worry all the questions on your uh, exam the answer a necessarily the various resources used to create a company's goods and services are collectively referred to as we just talked about that that's our factors of production collectively right we have those different factors of production but collectively they're considered factors of production by the way um, just to uh, 
make clear the numbering here. It's a little confusing because you see number 20 and you're like, well, I think we've only looked at four or five questions and we're already at number 20. Uh, I keep the original numbering from the test bank so that when I go back and I prepare your uh, exam, I know where I got that particular question from and I can go back and find something similar uh, that will be on your test. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Melinda is a store owner who buys items online to sell in her shop. Which of the following factors of production is best illustrated by Melinda's use of the internet? Again, we mentioned the internet being a what? What type of factor production? Technology, right? And this, uh, again, the internet, uh, is really reducing the cost of entering into many businesses, right? Uh, if you have the now, because you don't have to have nearly the computerized systems to be able to pull off certain types of businesses now, and so the internet is uh, definitely a technology that is being leveraged off of for a factor production. Okay, good. Any question? No? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and continue on. And we're just going through the uh, slides here for folks that uh, came in a little bit later. We're going through the slides for chapter one and actually looking at some of the uh, quiz questions and seeing how they connect up to the material in our lecture. But uh, we have Teresa and Lewis are getting married next month. Which of the following elements of their wedding is not a natural resource how about the wedding rings that's pretty much all natural resources gold diamonds whatever right unless uh maybe you know they got synthetic diamonds in their rings or something in which case maybe that's more of a technology uh how about the wedding vows how about the wedding vows do you think that's a uh, natural resource no, maybe that might be intellectual. Of course, we're not talking about a business situation here, but uh, maybe intellectual, but I would not call it uh, a, uh, a natural resource. Uh, the wedding cake, obviously, the what? The dresses, assuming they're using some sort of, you know, natural product and they're not, you know, made of uh, what, polyester or something like that. And then what? And uh, the table centerpieces, we're assuming and not having plastic flowers, right? Uh, real flowers. But clearly what the answer here is what? B. Okay. The wedding cake is using natural resources. Okay. All right. Good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at competition. Okay. And competition arises when two or more businesses contend with one another to attract customers and gain an advantage. Okay, we obviously know uh, that that is competition. So you have uh, what? Starbucks. Who competes with them? Pete's. What do you like, Pete's or Starbucks? I'm a Pete's kind of guy. I don't know, but uh, is there a Pete's around here? I keep in going, having to go to Starbucks. But what? Do you have these two different businesses that are competing against each other, right? Okay. And so what happens? Uh, competition forces companies to improve their product offerings. So what happens? Um, they are both serving coffee, but Starbucks starts to offer, I don't know, certain kind of pastry. And so Pete says, well, we better offer that pastry too or no one's going to come in for our coffee, right? Starbucks starts to warm up their sandwiches. So Pete says, you know, their morning sandwich, whatever. So Pete says, we better do that too, right? Okay. And so um, what's going to happen? Um, they could improving uh, more product offerings, but they could lower their prices as a result of competition. And what's going to happen? Hey, we can't charge $5 for a cup of coffee because the person will just go straight across the street to another coffee shop and, you know, pay a little less, right? Uh, aggressively promote their brands. We almost create the illusion that our product is better through advertising, et cetera, right? And we say that, uh, you know, Pete's makes you smarter or something like that. I don't know. And people will want to uh, come there. Uh, focus on customer satisfaction. We try to differentiate ourselves through our 
service, whatever, right? Okay, so all of these are arising out of competition as we try to bring, um, you know, our customer and pull them away from our competitor and bring them uh, towards us. Social media, uh, such as, uh, uh, what is this, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, all of these are what? Are good ways to expand our customer relations. I don't know, maybe we go ahead and we put on uh, Twitter, come now and you can get a 50 cent uh, cup of coffee or something, uh, and that brings people into our, uh, into our store or whatever. Okay. Uh, employee empowerment, allowing employees to solve customer concerns without management approval. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is streamline our process of serving our clients. If every time we have a client that has a certain need, we have to go through a chain of command to service that need, then we're not going to be as nearly as efficient as, say, another company that has flattened out their structure. They call it a flat structure, where the employees themselves can make decisions and uh, help satisfy the customer. Now, of course, we can't have them, you know, just going crazy with their decisions. I mean, a good way to serve the customer would be we'll give all the product away for free. We obviously don't want our employees making those sort of decisions. So we would probably have some guidelines. And within those guidelines, we would uh, let our employees have some latitude as to uh, how they make uh, decisions. Okay, now we talk about the social environment and how that affects businesses. And they talk about the baby boomer population here. And um, you can see that the baby boomer population is growing. Uh, what makes you a baby boomer, by the way? What year do you have to be born to be a baby boomer? Yeah, pretty close to that uh, right after World War II, okay, when we had uh, what? We had sort of this pent-up demand coming out of the war, coming out of um, the uh, Depression, and uh, people saved during World War II, and now all of a sudden they had all of this capital, right, that uh, they could start to feel comfortable about spending. And so that's when you started to have big growth in housing, in um, uh, car, car manufacturing, these sort of things, okay? And uh, what happens? You give people a home and you give them comfort. What do they do? They have kids, at least in those days, right? That's what they would do. They had kids. So you had a lot of children being born, and that started around the you know middle 40s, going all the way to about 1964. I'm actually considered at the tail end of the baby boom generation. I'm 54. So the baby boom generation is now what? Is now getting up there, right? I don't know how many of them are over 100. Um, not too many folks are making it up there but uh, obviously the society is aging and that you had that boom where you had a lot of people born within that time and now you know we're all starting to get a little bit uh, pretty old, pretty long in the tooth here now um, one thing about the housing what sparked the growth in housing is 1934 they created the um, the notion that the federal government would back home loans so that if somebody wasn't able to pay their home loan, they called the Federal Home uh, Administration, Federal Housing Administration, the federal government backed home loans so that if somebody didn't pay on their home loan, the federal government would cover it. Okay, This is why banks are willing to loan money to you to purchase a home. Before then, you pretty much had to come up with the cash to buy a house, right? And what happens? The housing um, market drives much of the rest of the economy because if you buy a house, then what do you have to buy? Got to buy furniture, right? Got to buy some appliances, all the stuff that goes into the house, the carpeting, the, uh, you, you know, the... Um, 
the the drapes, all of that stuff, the hardwood floors, all of that does what? Has a significant contribution to the economy. So we mentioned that, right? That the federal government, once they came in and said, if you loan somebody the money to buy a house, if that person doesn't pay, we'll cover that loan. That created a completely different dynamic where banks and lenders were now what? Now would be silly if they didn't loan you the money to buy the house because there's little risk there for them because the federal government is going to back that. That really started, that also started in 1934. That started this growth in housing, the baby booming generation. That had a lot to do with sparking the economy. Uh, cars, vehicles, what happens? Well, of course, you have to pay the people to work in the factories, but what about all of the other pieces of the vehicle, the factories that make what? Make the felt that goes into these different pieces of the vehicle. All of this also drives the economy to a large extent as well. Anyway, I'm getting off the track a little bit here and that what? Uh, you have these baby boomers that are aging now, and so you're starting to see that there's going to be a need for products, services that help older people. That's where there's a lot of opportunity now as more and more of the society is getting older. Um, you guys maybe don't watch television stations that are designed for... Uh, for people my age, okay, but uh, I watch uh, this, uh, all the political stations, and my TV is like constantly on the political stations. What did Trump say today? What did Hillary say today? I came kind of hooked on this stuff, but every commercial is for some health ailment, okay? Oh, you have this problem. You have diabetes. You can take this. You have, you know, some problem with your with your legs, whatever. You can take these uh, these uh, pills and what? That is a big industry. The pharmaceutical industry has grown tremendously and they've been p positioning themselves for years as we have had this aging demographic. So this aging demographic can help to do what? Can help to, um, you know, more, provide more business opportunity also provides challenges for government programs. Social Security, they are saying, will, um, actually it's already to a point now, uh, for years when you had the baby boomer generation all working and they were paying into the Social Security and there weren't as many people drawing on it, Social Security had a surplus for all of those years. Now we're to a point where there's actually less people working than there are going to be drawing on Social Security. And so what happens? Now the Social Security funds are going to create more and more of a deficit, and that deficit is going to increase at an exponential rate as you have more and more people drawing Social Security and what? Fewer people paying into it. This creates a tremendous concern for the government, right? Um, what? Health care is becoming a, well, it has been a big problem for the government for some time. And Obama tried with the Affordable uh, Care Act, they call it Obamacare. He tried to address that, but clearly that is having some problems now. And they're going to have to continue to struggle to be able to provide the health care as you get an, old, an older aging population. The way I describe it to some of my, uh, some of my older friends, just to make them scared sometimes, and uh, they get this this funny look when I say this. I'd say, well, imagine a village, okay, in which you had a bunch of old people sitting around and telling a fewer number of young people, go out and hunt for us and bring us back the food or whatever, right? What would they eventually do to those old people? They would take them out somewhere and just say, okay, you all just go sit over there and uh, we'll see you later. And we're just going to fend for ourselves, right? And so uh, this is a problem, um, creates a lot of challenges for the government. Increasing diversity, okay? It used to be, what, um, 
black, white. We start to add different demographic groups now. We have, uh, what, Latino, Hispanic, Asian, all of these different groups that we add. And now we are starting to understand more about what? About gender diversity, et cetera, right? And so that grows more as society becomes more sensitive to uh, the differences that we all have, right? And so um, what's happening? Now, companies need to be more cognizant of that. And it's not like a company can put an ethical policy in place and just assume that it's going to be relevant forever, right? So companies have to be more vigilant to make sure that their ethical policies, et cetera, are reflecting the uh, changing diversity, okay? Um, the green movement, okay? More environmental concerns, um, you know, I tell my classes to print out the slides and bring them to class, right? And uh, someone said the other day, printing is old school, John. We don't print anymore. We do what? We use our tablet. We use our PC, et cetera, so that we don't have to, you know, uh, tear down a bunch of trees to take the notes in the class and so that we don't have to... Um, you know, fill up the landfills with all the waste paper and that sort of thing, okay? This also creates new product opportunities. Um, for example, we have, what, green products now that are going to be more friendly to the environment when we have to dispose of them. Uh, the opportunities for, the, we mentioned, the laptops. Um, just... Uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, dispose of waste more uh, in a more f environmental friendly way creates product service opportunities. Um, what happens? If you think about it, Uber is sort of a green product because more and more of your generation are deciding I don't even need to own a vehicle because I can use Uber I can use I forget where they call those where you pick up the car in one place and then you drive it and leave it in the next place what do they call that huh certain huh Burke car Zip, yeah, zip, yeah, zip car, something like that. I think they even may call it green car in some cases where you don't own a vehicle and you just use one for a longer trip. And for the most part, you get around using public transportation in that. So that's creating what? That's creating opportunities. However, if um, uh, Tesla, okay, what? Having the cars that don't have all the fuel emissions are what? are another uh, green opportunity that's being created. So all of these are opportunities, right? Can you think of any uh, threats to companies that are created by us moving more to a green type of environment? Green driven economy, whatever you want to call it. How about you? What do you think? What's your name? Huh? Katija, can you think of any th businesses that are threatened by a green initiative? Gas prices can go down. Gas prices can go down. Worse yet, nobody's going to use cars that use fossil fuels anymore. So if you're an oil company, you might, um, you know, feel okay right now, but you would be a little bit derelict in your duties if you weren't looking down the road 50 years and saying, how will we continue to be viable as a company, right? Okay, so it's not enough in business to understand what is currently in place, a what? A business needs to look into the future, and uh, maybe you're not going to look 50 years into the future and start doing things now, but you certainly need to consider that possibility, right, and start thinking about uh, what you could do. I'm, I'm personally of the opinion that 50 years from now, we will look at the fact that we burn fossil fuels and say, what were we thinking? Why were we polluting the environment with those things when we have, what, vehicles that run very efficiently, very effectively on low emission type things, right? Okay. All right, good. So just some uh, ideas as to how uh, changing social um, 
environment can affect businesses and they talk about opportunities here but it also can present uh, challenges as well okay good globalization okay globalization is going to create more and more uh, opportunities as well and uh, we need to think about a globalized economy now okay um, you can have now foreign companies list on the US stock exchanges can't you okay so what's going to happen that creates now capital opportunities coming from what from all over the world you can have foreign investors investing in the United States I tend, I think we tend to think of um, you know US companies investing in foreign companies but more and more the arrow is coming the other way where you're having foreign investors investing in US companies so you could literally have now where the parent company is overseas and the subsidiary is the US company um, all of this creates additional opportunities and uh, you can see here that uh, you know we're talking about trade with China in the past and I'm not sure that that's exactly in the past because we still have quite a bit of trade with China much of uh, what China produces we consume here in the US uh, but what more recently um, Vietnam India some of these other countries okay um, what is the number one economy in the world now try again not China huh if it's not China so yes it is the United States okay United States is still the number one economy and I think that a lot of that is driven by entrepreneurial capital for example if you go to China and you visit everyone is uh, you know the Chinese uh, 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 citizens are all holding what iPhone they make the iPhone right here don't they okay and so what's happening you are still having the US as the number one economy and I think that will be driven to a large extent by entrepreneurial entrepreneurial capital uh, as we go forward okay but these other economies are um, growing obviously and that growth um, some people want to say well that's a threat to the US because then that means that jobs for manufacturing and that that were in the US before are now being you know taken overseas US I mean uh, China uh, India Mexico you hear about in the news a lot now but I think it also provides an opportunity because what happens as incomes go up in these other places now they can afford products that can be produced in the United States and if the United States uses its entrepreneurial capital to produce the products that the world wants then what then that actually creates an opportunity right okay and so as a business we are looking for those type of opportunities where we can uh, you know take advantage of the growth and the economic viabilities of these other countries and uh, you know sell our products our services could even be services right you say well how would you provide a service overseas how would you provide a service overseas Cause don't you have to be there to serve Well, that's yeah okay outsourcing is when we have a function that was in the US and we maybe have that overseas like the service department answers calls overseas I'm thinking uh, how would how would say a company in the US and I guess they are providing a service to the US overseas so I see what you're saying the the I'm thinking from this perspective of the US since we're here right but yeah you're right those those uh, uh, you could have a company in the in another country that does what that specializes in providing that sort of uh, um, that sort of service to the US right or other e or even other countries that's a good point I didn't think of it that way I'm thinking US out right but it could be coming into the US a service yes sir
something else. And right. In, uh, in, the South, in uh, the Congo, that quality of the product is uh, uh, less expensive. Right. Right, so they're going to tailor the product to the market, right? Tailor, tailor the market to, uh, product to the market, right? Um, I'm thinking too the U.S. providing a service to another country um, overseas. Um, the example that I think of, um, you can now take the U.S. CPA exam, and I was directly involved in this, so this is why I can think of this example. Um, you can now take the U.S. Certified Public Accountants exam in other countries because, for example, you could take it in Japan, you could take it in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and uh, so there's broader interest in taking the U.S. CPA exam in other countries because those other countries uh, have companies that want to list on the U.S. stock exchanges. So what happens? They have to demonstrate to the Security Exchange Commission which is the federal government agency that regulates investments. They have to demonstrate that their staff know about the U.S. accounting standards. And the way they demonstrate that is by taking the U.S. CPA exam in these other countries. Okay? And so for that reason, um, I've been involved in a company where we actually went to those other countries and talked to them about taking the course that I teach for getting people ready for the CPA exam. So we went to China, we went to t Japan, we went to the Middle East and literally talked to them about how we can help them to pass the U.S. CPA exam. So now we're doing what? We're providing a service to another country um, you know, overseas. So it can be services. We tend to think of it products, but both products products and services can be uh, offered overseas, right? Okay, good. And then technological changes, okay, are going to um, create opportunities for us. Now, we say that technological changes demand time and capital. That's to develop them, right? Later on, a technological change can save us time, right? Um, but uh, at first, it's going to um, require time and capital, but the benefits are going to be lower cost, improved productivity, uh, security, communications, and, um, you know, for example, it now allows for telecommuting, teleconferencing, again, maybe feeding into the social uh, factors that we've talked about, uh, you know, taking more of a green approach if everybody's not driving to get to these different places and we telecommute, et cetera. Okay. So if you ask me, uh, the internet is the huge technological change, right? I mean, that is uh, driving a lot of uh, the technology now. E-commerce, okay, you have what? You have business to consumer. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. So you have, uh, you know, Amazon, that sort of thing is a business to consumer. You have business to business. This is where one business provides service to another business. For example, a CPA firm is providing a service to a company when they prepare their tax return, right? Their business tax return. That's going to be a business to business. Consumer to consumer. Anyone got an example of consumer to consumer? Yes, sir. Huh? eBay is the classic example of uh, consumer to consumer, right? Again, notice when we start talking about um, you know, things that are emerging, it almost always has a foot in the internet somewhere, doesn't it? Okay, but yeah, uh, Uber is really a what, sort of a consumer to consumer type of thing as well, right? Okay, so that's growing. Um, you know, some of the concerns there, if we're doing um, online um, transactions, is the concern about privacy. Uh, someone hacks into the database of Amazon or something like that, that could be a pretty, uh, pretty major disaster for a company like Amazon. So they have to have the appropriate security if they're going to be receiving all of the different credit card information, et cetera, of individuals that are going to be using uh, their uh, website to get information. Um, another thing that you have in this business to business 
elect, a lot of times they have something that they call electronic data interchange, EDI. And with electronic data interchange, um, what happens is my business computers talk directly to your business computers. Okay, so as soon as my computer note realizes that inventory levels are getting down to a certain, certain level, rather than a person having to realize that and put in an order, the computer will automatically generate an order to your computer to ship the goods at that point in time. They call this electronic data interchange. Does that create any problem for us in terms of our computer security? Does that create any problem for us? If the what? If the entity that we're doing the electronic data interchange with has a breach in their security, that could be a portable into a portal into what? Into our computer system. So um, you can have um, a type of audit that is done. They call these um, sys trust agreements or sys trust audits in which a CPA will come in and look at the computerized systems and say, yes, they are good for electronic data interchange, et cetera. So there are ways of making sure that we have the appropriate security, but it certainly is something that we need to think about if we're going to be um, using e-commerce. Okay, good. Now we come over and we talk about types of businesses. You can have local business. You can have regional businesses. Okay, now challenges for these local businesses, they tend to be smaller, so there's difficulty managing money. They can be undercapitalized, meaning that they don't have the capital for expansion, et cetera, because they tend to be smaller. Controlling costs can be more difficult. If you're a larger company, obviously you can have a larger volume of items that you purchase. You can get a better cost, um, so controlling costs can be difficult for local businesses and regional businesses. Local meaning what? A business in Fremont. Regional being what? A business in California, okay, or the West Coast. Um, you know, that would be an example of regional. Okay, national businesses are going to be, um, you know, nationwide, obviously. Okay, and uh, they are going to be uh, having goods coming to them from a supplier. They manufacture those goods. They have them uh, to a wholesale. They get them to a wholesaler. Wholesaler gets them to a retailer, and then they finally get to the consumer. So you have uh, supplier supplies uh, fabric, right? The manufacturer is Nike. Then what? Then we have the wholesaler. I don't know who a wholesaler of Nike is. I don't know. Nike, you don't have to have a wholesaler. Nike may sell directly to the retailer is, uh, what is it, uh, Foot Locker or whatever, right? And then, of course, uh, we would be the consumers. We go and buy those uh, Nike, whatever, Air Jordans or whatever they are, right? Okay. Okay. So that prop, uh, process would be an example of a national uh, type of business and what we have to balance our budget manage our finances we have to be aware of state laws that could be different in the different states as we start to you know uh, distribute our goods across state lines and uh, now we have to manage longer more complex supply chains they literally have uh, as a discipline you could focus if you decide to do that uh, that uh, career development project, you may be someone that wants to get into the supply chain management business. This is a, a growing area where there's an expectation that we would make this as efficient as possible. For example, these days we're trying to get away from this idea that we just manufacture the goods and then store them in inventory somewhere waiting for somebody to purchase them because that costs money to what? To store inventory, doesn't it? Not only the warehousing, but what happens? 
people start to steal the inventory, that sort of thing, don't they? Okay, some could get damaged, etc. So they have what they call lean production now, in which we will not produce our goods until we actually have an order for them. And that's becoming more and more the case. For example, nowadays, if you have a computer and you order that online or something, you, they don't say, oh, okay, we're just to pull one off the shelf. They make it to your specifications and then they send it out to you, right? Okay, so uh, that is something that uh, would make your supply chain more, um, more efficient. Now, what they're not mentioning here, still part of the supply chain, though, to a certain extent, is research and development. Before we can start to produce a product, we have to have come up with whatever that product's going to be, right? So we'd also have some R&D that would go into this as well, um, again, bringing in our intellectual um, our intellectual property. Okay, multinational businesses. Obviously, uh, we're going to have uh, differences in international laws, cultural differences, economic differences. Um, if you're going to produce in China, you need to be careful and that they don't have the same copyright and same patent uh, laws that we have in the U.S. And so you have to take extra steps to make sure that you're protecting your intellectual property, etc. So these are the type of things uh, that you would need to be aware of here. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look. And this really... I think this question is better placed in chapter two, but I think we could answer it uh, pretty easily. The what United States economy? What do you think? Do you think it's non-competitive? No. It's, do you think it's not for profit? No. We have not for profit entities, but that's not what drives our economy. What is it? It's market based, right? Market based. And I don't even think we had that on one of the slides, and you know that. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get into chapter two here. Okay, okay, good. Come over, let's take a look at this one. Which of the following is not a benefit of business competition? Um, not a benefit. It may lead to a wider variety of goods. Now, that is a benefit, isn't it? Remember, we're looking for what is not a benefit. So we're looking at the thing that we don't think is a benefit. Remember uh, when uh, whatever one I said started making sandwiches, the other one did, when Pete started, Starbucks did or whatever. Okay, so that is leading to a wider variety of goods and services. It may lead to higher quality goods and services. That's not not a benefit. That what? That is a benefit um, because I have to draw my uh, my my customers uh, my my competitors customer away from them and towards me right so I might very much invent a better product it may lead to a limited variety of goods and services well look if we said what if we say that a is uh, is a benefit then C, it may lead to a limited, that's not a benefit, and it's not even true. It's not even a true statement because we're thinking it's going to have more innovation, wider variety of products. So what? So C is not a benefit, right? Is C a benefit? Is C a benefit? It is not a benefit, so C is the correct answer, isn't it? Okay. It may lead to cheaper goods and services. That is a benefit. It may lead to increased customer satisfaction. That is a benefit. So the one thing here that is not a benefit is C. It's actually going to increase probably the goods, right? A little bit of a tricky one there when they say what is not a benefit and you're thinking, let me look for the benefit. You need to look for the one that is what? That is clearly not the benefit. That's what you look for there. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. Jarvis runs a restaurant that has had a lot of complaints from customers lately. Jarvis is a strict manager and prefers to make all the decisions himself. A concerned friend recommends that Jarvis delegate more decision-making responsibility to his employees. Which of the following would be the most likely result of D Jarvis delegating responsibility. Customers will be upset because the restaurant is being run differently. 
they don't care unless, you know, Jarvis was always, you know, coming straight to their table and saying, how can I help you today? Now, Jarvis doesn't show up. They might not like that. Um, but, um, no, nah, they probably don't care as long as their chicken's cooked, right? Okay, in the restaurant. Okay, item B, customer satisfaction will improve because employees can be more responsive to customer needs. I'm thinking, right, if the uh, customer says, hey, I don't want... Uh, you know, I want more gravy or something, then what? Then if we give the employee the right to go ahead and give them the gravy that they want, customers are going to be happy because they're getting that, what they're getting what they want, right? Okay. Um, customer satisfaction will decrease because employees will make the wrong decisions. Well, we hope they don't make the wrong decisions. They could, but uh, we're going to trust them to hope that they'll make the right decisions, right? Okay. D, employees will quit because of the change in Jarvis management style. I think it's the opposite. I think it's the opposite. In fact, what's likely to happen here is the employee is more likely to take personal ownership over the satisfaction of that customer, and they're going to come up with creative, better ways to make those customers happy, right? Uh, gee, sorry, ma'am, that you don't like the gravy. You know, usually we, um, you know, serve the gravy cold. Do you want me to heat it up for you or something? And so what? The customer is, I mean, excuse me, the employee is trying to satisfy that customer. We may even come up with, you know, the only place with hot chicken gravy or something. I don't know at uh, that point, and maybe we'll invent some, you know, come up with some way of differentiating ourselves from our competitors. Um, the restaurant will need to increase its prices. Why? It may be able to decrease the prices because we're getting more uh, satisfied customers coming in, right? So the answer here Clearly what? Clearly B, customer satisfaction we think will improve because our employees are taking more personal ownership. They care more about what they're doing in their job. And as a result, they're doing a better job, right? And uh, the customers are more satisfied. Okay. Which of the following problems is potentially posed by an aging population? Uh, which of the following problems is potentially posed? Higher taxes? Could be higher taxes if we have to do what? Pay for all these programs to take care of all these old people, right? But uh, let's see if there's a better answer. Lower deficit? I'm thinking it's going to do what? Increase the deficit to pay for all these programs. C, labor surpluses? I don't think so. As those uh, old folks start to want to sit around and enjoy the good life, there's going to be less labor available. Fewer business opportunities, I think it's going to be what? It's going to be increase business opportunities, especially if you're in the, in, in the medical industry, right? How about D, decrease demand for social services? It's going to be what? An increased demand for social services. So which of the following problems is posed by an aging population? Potential what? Higher taxes, right? As we have to start to pay for all these programs. Okay, so we're going to have to raise your taxes so that you can go to work, work, get less money for your work so that you can make sure that I get my pension. Thank you very much. How long is that going to last? Okay. Now, the if you're old, the good thing is to, hey, stay relevant. Stay relevant and what? You're going to have item, uh, uh, what is it, labor surpluses? No, there's labor what? There's labor deficiency, and as an older person stays relevant, they can continue to earn later in, in their in their later years, right? So that's something for you to keep in mind. You're probably too young to think about that now, but the more you stay relevant with technology, et cetera, that opportunity is going to continue to grow for you in the future, right? Okay, so you can you can sort of fight against that one uh, labor uh, uh, labor deficiencies and uh, and uh, they're saying here labor surpluses are not going to be the case, which I think they're right. But you yourself personally can respond to that by keeping yourself relevant in technology, etc. 
Okay, Tom is a college senior who would like to get a green collar job. Okay, what does he want to work for the Oakland A's? I think they call theirs green collar baseball, but whatever. Um, that means that what? That means that uh, he wants to work in the green environment, right? And so, uh, which of the following positions is he least likely to apply for? A job as a wind turbine engineer? No, wind power is a green technology, isn't it? How about a job installing solar panels? That's right in his wheelhouse, right? I uh, probably get a solar panel person comes by my house every six months to try to put, uh, talk me into getting solar panels on my house. I don't do it because I'm an accountant. And so I sit there and when they're trying to convince me the money I'm going to save in solar panels, I start taking their information and putting it into present value calculations and everything else. And I end up wanting the price to be so low to justify it that they say, sorry, we can't do that. Um, so their employees have not been empowered by the solar company to satisfy the customer. And so... Uh, I end up never getting it, but uh, it's certainly something that as the cost comes down, more and more people are going to go to the solar, uh, solar panel, solar energy, and so this guy would be uh, working right in that industry. A job as a manager in an oil refinery? Is that something he's going to want to do? No, the oil refinery, that's the old technology. That's the non-green technology, right? And so... Uh, that's probably the one he's not going to do. Waterproofing houses, a oh, weatherproofing. I'm thinking to myself, waterproofing? <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. Once water comes, it comes. There's not a whole lot you can do to waterproof a house, right, if there's a flood. Uh, job selling hybrid cars? Sure, right? That's going to be obvious green uh, technology. Okay? Okay, good. So obviously he's not going to work in the oil refinery. Okay, good. Uh, taking business personally. Um, you know, some of these questions here. Um, let's start with an easy one. How do you keep up with new technology? Yes, sir. Huh? Advertising? Advertising? Yeah, I guess in a way, right? You see an advertisement for a new product, you go, oh, that looks good. I'm going to see what that's all about, right? Yeah, I hadn't thought of that before, but uh, I always think of, you know, you're having to go to attend technical conferences to see what the latest is, but you're right. You sit there and you see something that looks like a new, uh, excuse me, a brand new product uh, that looks like it's something that would help you to keep up with technology. Sure, that's a good thought. Any other ways? Um, kind of just staying up to date like with your social media. Staying up to date with the social media, okay. That would be a way, okay. Um, one good way to stay with technology is dive into it. I mean, just force yourself to get into sort of like you're doing with your education, right? But we'll do what? Look for a class you think, that looks to me like that's really hard. I don't know that I can understand that. That's the class to take. Okay, That's the class to take and force yourself. Jump on in and uh, you'll see that your, your, your instincts are better than anyone's advice. I can sit here all day and say, you know, you should study this and read this book, that. But if you're having to actually respond to a situation where you're thrust into, you know, a survival mode, so to speak, that instinct is going to cause you to learn faster than anything, any other way that you could come with, whether it be reading books, watching, you know, uh, advertising, etc. Okay. Um, what types of financial goals do you have? You want a big house or a little house? You want a big house? Okay. 
that starts to drive certain things, right? Some people say, I just want to be comfortable, whatever, right? Every individual is different, you know? Myself, I want people to walk into my house and go, this is too big for you, right? Other people, you know, they don't want that. They want to feel that they're, you know, living in a more uh, comfortable, more uh, suitable environment, whatever, for their purposes, right? But those sorts of decisions drive your goals. What type of vehicle do you want? All of these financial goals. Uh, do you want to retire? Retire at a certain age, right? All of that drives your financial goals. Um, how about um, how would you keep your business secure? Let's say you're involved in e-commerce. How would you keep your business secure? Would you get any help with that? Would you worry about that? Okay. You might call in a what IT professional that will sit there and make sure that your, uh, you know, that your systems are maintaining security. Um, you keep your business secure now by having a virus uh, program on your computer, don't you? Okay. So, um, how does the social environment affect your life? Social environment affect your life. going to have to start being kinder to old people, right? Because there's going to be more and more of them. Okay. That doesn't mean you have to be kinder to them. There will be more of them, though. Okay. Okay. So all of these things are, um, you know, food for thought. Uh, and you can... You can use these through analogy as to how you would apply this in business, right? Um, I used to have this friend that I worked with at uh, the GAO, and um, we used to get annoyed at my office. I worked for the federal government for, as I mentioned, 30 years, the Government Accountability Office. And we used to get annoyed because um, everyone would bring their little Tupperware and warm up their lunch in the microwave and eat their lunch there. And you could see they were trying to save money for lunch, right? And we would have this argument that, no, we're going to go out to lunch and we're going to go to an expensive place so that we feel like businessmen. And we're going to sit here and we're going to come up with different ways that we can make money and talk about different ways to make money while we're acting like big shots at lunch. Okay, that was sort of our thing that we would we did. And in those days, everybody dressed up in a suit and tie. So we'd go to these places and eat lunch and talk about the future and how we were going to make money and that sort of thing. So what happens? You could apply that sort of um, things now to how you would uh, do in business. It's not a bad idea. In fact, I used to have a friend that he'd always wanted another friend that said, John, let's talk about the future. And I used to be like, I don't want to talk about the future. You know, then why does he want to talk about the future? But I realized now he was right. He wanted to think about how we were going to make money, what things were going to be like in the future. Think about your expenses, how you would control those, those folks that were bringing the smaller lunch. Maybe they were trying to do what? Save capital that would be available for their goals, et cetera, uh, later on. So all of these uh, questions up here, you can think about them and uh, think about them from a personal standpoint. But then what? You can start to think about how you would apply those in a business setting. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much chapter one, and I think we're going to stop there. We get out at 1030, right? So we're going to stop there, and we'll do chapter two next time, okay? But we saw some key definitions, just giving us an overview. What I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to be putting the chapter two slides up as well as the quiz in the next couple of days and so you will be able to see those go ahead and once again bring the slides bring the uh the, the quiz but the quiz will actually be in the slides anyway so just bring the slides and you can follow along and make notations etc as we go through these and i think that that's the best way for you to uh, study for this class i don't advise just um, sitting there with a notepad and writing a couple things down that I say, if you're on the slide that I'm talking about and you write that down or you're on the quiz question that I'm talking about and you write that down, that's going to be much more useful for you, right? So uh, get those.
those, bring them in some format, either print them or you can, um, you know, use your laptop or your tablet, whatever. Okay. Okay, guys, have a good rest of the day, rest of the week, and I will see you next week.